Making documentaries is hard. It's confusing, you feel like you're wandering around in a maze. It's just this ever-changing puzzle. Today I want to share with you 10 lessons I've learned about documentary filmmaking in my transition from making vlogs here on YouTube to becoming a professional working documentary filmmaker. If you're new here, my name's Mark Johansson. I'm a documentary director based in British Columbia, Canada. I've been making commercial films and documentaries for about five years now, and I've actually been lucky enough to have some of the films I've directed or edited end up in film festivals all around the world. I've had some wins, but I've also made a ton of mistakes along the way, and so I'm rebooting this YouTube channel, sharing any lessons that I've learned in the past or I'm currently learning in the hopes that some of you find it relatable and you can learn something and we can all get better at the craft of filmmaking. So without further ado, let's get into the list. Number one, documentary filmmaking is guesswork. As a documentary filmmaker, the goal is to tell a great story, to prove a point about someone or something that you're observing in the world around you. But when you're starting off making a documentary, you don't know what you don't know. You don't have all the information up front. You haven't met all your characters. You haven't shot anything yet. You just have an idea. You have an idea of what you think the story's gonna be. And you ultimately just have to make a guess. And once you make that guess, you start going out and interviewing people based on what you think the story is going to be. And the best case, you nailed it. Your idea was perfect. It perfectly lines up with the reality of your characters and everything goes smoothly and you just shoot it and you're done. That rarely happens, if ever. If that happens to you, consider yourself lucky. What will most likely happen is the moment you start talking to people, your story changes. You find out new pieces of information. You find another interesting character who can provide a different angle to your film. Whatever it is, there's always moving parts in documentary filmmaking. This is okay though. This is the cycle of making a documentary film. You make a guess, you go shoot some stuff, and then you refine your story. Make a guess, shoot stuff, refine your story. As a documentary filmmaker, you just have to get used to the fact that there is this uncertainty and that you are not going to know exactly what you're doing at any given moment and that anything can change. This process is unpredictable, but it's also what makes shooting documentary films so fun. Number two, documentaries are about characters, not facts. Characters are what make us care about your film. We don't care about facts and figures as much as we think we do. We care about how these facts and figures affect human beings. We want to root for someone. And without a character in your film, we have no one to root for. Think of your favorite documentary that you've watched recently. Take a second, pause the video, have a think about it. I can almost guarantee that what you're remembering is not things like numbers or information or even specific events, but you're remembering the characters of the documentary and how they were reacting to the events that occurred throughout the story. I love rock climbing. I'm very partial to climbing documentaries. So let's take the example of Free Solo. Now, don't get me wrong, what Alex Honnold did is absolutely insane and that is a huge part of why you remember that film but for me what sticks around in my mind is not necessarily that he free soloed el capitan it's more so getting to know alex as a person he's such a fascinating human being he he's not the prototypical athlete in many ways and he's really goofy He's got a very serious side. He can switch off his brain. He's, he's just got so many facets to him. And what's fascinating about Free Solo is getting to see Alex's process, getting to see him fight with his emotional battle between pursuing what he loves to do, rock climbing, and his relationship with Sammy and trying to make that work, knowing that what he does for a living could very well kill him. You get to know Alex on a very personal level, and by the end of the film, when he goes to do the climb, you feel like you're his friend. 
And because you feel emotionally attached to him, that adds huge stakes to the story. All of a sudden, you feel like you're watching your own friend climb this wall without a rope. Getting to know characters like Alex is what takes your film from being just a news article of so-and-so climbed a big wall to an emotionally compelling narrative arc that leaves you on the edge of your seat. Character is at the heart of storytelling, and storytelling is the core of documentary filmmaking. Three, the most important emotion in your film is empathy. As human beings, we can't help but judge people. It's something that's wired into the ancient survival circuits of our brain. When we meet someone in person, on screen, wherever, we can't help but try and categorize them, put them in bins in our brain. We make a snap judgment on who we think they are and how we think we relate to them. Are they a good person? Do I, do I think I would enjoy being around them? Are they terrible, mean, selfish person that's just pure evil? Are they somewhere in between? We like to be able to categorize people so that we can understand them. But in films, you can have good or bad people. It doesn't really matter. The audience doesn't necessarily care if someone's good or bad. They just want to be able to root for them in some kind of way. And when you instill empathy, when your audience can see themselves in the character in some way, shape, or form, when the external pressures of the story are beating them down, you're naturally just going to want to root for them, even if they are doing terrible things. Some of the best films actually toe this line. They like to play in that gray area where you find yourself rooting for and caring for people that are probably not the people you'd stand by in your regular day-to-day -day life. The perfect example of this is Breaking Bad. Take Walter White as a character. He starts off as this kind of sad high school teacher who's dying, who wants to leave his family with a lot of money, and you naturally feel for him. You root for him because it seems like life has been unfair to this guy and he's a good person who just wants to do right by the people he loves. Fast forward to the end of it, Walter does terrible things. He hurts people way more than he helps people. But because you've been with him throughout this entire journey, there's so many moments where you stop the episode and you realize you're like cheering for someone who's trying to kill an innocent person. We stick with him because we hope deep down that he'll be able to finally see his own flaws and get back to that more innocent version of himself, which he never does, but that's the hope we cling on to as the audience. So remember, if you want an audience to stick around to the end of your film, give them a reason to care about your characters. Instill that empathy. Make them root for your protagonists, even if they're not necessarily a hero, even if they are an anti-hero. I had to throw in the reference, my wife's been listening to a lot of Taylor Swift. Number four, better pre-production means a better film. When I first started making documentaries in particular, I had this notion inside my head that making a documentary is about showing up on the spot, reacting to everything that's happening, and then taking all of that into the edit and making a story out of it. While there is an element of reacting on the spot to documentary filmmaking, this ideology was actually hurting my films a lot. An important lesson I learned was pre-production and how pre-production can be used in a documentary. Pre-production for documentary filmmaking is essentially the art of setting creative boundaries for yourself. Pre-production is where you sit down before you start shooting anything and you make a battle plan for how you want to shoot this film. You sit down and you figure out things like what are some themes you want to explore? Who are some of the characters you want to interview? 
how many days are you going to need to shoot it, where you want to shoot it, and what time of year will you need extra crew to shoot it. And most importantly, it's where you sit down and really iron out what you think your story is going to be and what you want to say with this film. There's plenty of tools to do this with. I personally use Milanote. They're not a sponsor. I just like using it. Uh, it's just really easy. But what you want to do in this phase is lay out the framework and think of all of the possible things that could potentially shift or go wrong in your production so that when you are on the ground, when you are shooting, oftentimes those production days are very long. You're tired. You've been in a camera all day. You're taxed. You're emotionally exhausted and creatively spent. And you just have to keep going. You just have to keep finding stuff to shoot. And when you're in that moment where you, you know, let's say the sun is setting and the light's beautiful and you know you just need to capture something, but you don't know what because you're just like exhausted. Having this plan to fall back on is a great form of guidance. You can look at all of the different scenes or topics that you're trying to cover throughout your shoot and look at them and say, okay, I got enough of that. I got enough of that. Maybe I need to shoot more of this. It, it gives you a direction to head in and it frees up a lot of the logistical thinking so you can stay creative and focus on making your film the best it can possibly be because you kind of only get your production window once and you want to ensure that you're spending as much of that time getting high quality, interesting, intentional shots and work and not running around like you're lost and panicked and just full of anxiety. It's not fun and it's not productive. Pre-production is key. Five, you can capture most things after they've happened. Another thing I would do when I first started out was I would run around and just try and capture everything all the time as events were unfolding. I would pretty much be rolling non-stop and this led to me feeling panicked it led to feelings like i'm always missing a shot you know i'm not shooting enough and in the post-production side of things i would end up with a hard drive full of tons and tons of footage and most of it wasn't that great because oftentimes i would just be sitting there waiting for something to happen and hoping that it just unfolds in front of me there are moments throughout your shoot that are only going to happen once. Let's say your film's about, you know, an ultra marathon runner who's running his first, I don't know, 50k race. There's so many moments throughout that day that are repeatable. He or she may be running for, say, five, six hours, and you're not going to be able to be there all the time right next to them rolling on everything as it happens. So much of that run is going to look similar anyways. Even if you were able to capture all of that run, 90% of it's going to look exactly the same. And you're only going to use a little chunk of what you shot. But that being said, there is gonna be one really great, genuine moment that happens that day, and it's when they cross the finish line. All of the endorphins are gonna be running through their body. They've been working so hard for this. They finally accomplished their goal. They're gonna be on a high. They're gonna be exhausted. You can't really just rock up one day and get someone to replicate that. So you know that you need to be there and capturing that moment as it unfolds. The rest of it, however, you can go back and shoot another day. You can get them to wear the number plate. You can even go to the same spot and get them to run through the forest or on the road, wherever it was. And you can get really nice cinematic shots of that unfolding. And you get the benefit of not shooting a ton of film so it'll be easier when you're in the edit. So do yourself a favor, make it easier on your editor or on yourself if you're the one editing. Don't shoot absolutely everything. The day of a shoot, sit down and ask yourself what you absolutely need to capture as it unfolds and try and capture the other things, but don't sweat it if you can't get those other things. You'll be able to shoot them another day. Focus on what you need to capture. It'll save you a lot of stress. Number six, cinematography matters more to filmmakers than the audience. 
Cinematography is sexy. Don't get me wrong. Learning lighting, learning composition. I enjoy color grading. So much of the visual language is just so fun to learn and it just feels so good when you get sick shots and you're just waiting and you're gonna go home and you're gonna transfer them to your computer and you're gonna look at them in Resolve and you're gonna be drooling. It's fun. That's my point. It's, it's fun and it's easy to focus on. It's also getting easier and easier to get really good results with consumer level products and using YouTube as a learning platform. You know, look at The Creator, which is a Hollywood film shot on the FX3 and it looks stunning. It looks so good. But even though cinematography is getting cheaper and easier to accomplish, storytelling is not. And storytelling is what makes your audience fall in love with a film. There's so many films that I watch on Netflix or even sometimes in the theaters where you walk out and you don't immediately feel the need to like turn to whoever you're with and just chat about like everything you loved about the movie because it just kind of feels lackluster, like it falls flat. That's because storytelling is really, really hard and it's hard to understand why certain stories hit us so hard and make such an impact and why other stories fall flat. Whereas with cinematography, it's easy to tell when an image is technically good or technically bad and point out like why it's good or bad. To an average audience member who's not a filmmaker, they just want to be moved emotionally by the story. They just want to feel something. It's why we watch films. And cinematography can totally enhance that and it can stretch out these emotions and really add to the whole experience. But it's an enhancer. It's the polish. It's not the core of why people are there. So as much as we love to focus on cinematography, what I've learned for myself is to set a bar for my cinematography of what I want to achieve in terms of a look and feel and try not to overachieve on that. I try not to focus too much on the cinematography if it means I'm risking capturing something that helps tell my story. So if events are unfolding and a beautiful moment's happening between a father and daughter and I'm there adjusting my light, that feeling sucks. Will I care that my shot's 10% nicer? Maybe, but I just missed a beautiful real moment happening. So just keep that in mind as you're shooting. It matters, cinematography helps enhance things, but it's not the be all end all of filmmaking. Number seven, shoot in scenes. I don't know why, but at first I didn't really think of documentaries as containing scenes, not in the way that you think of Hollywood scenes or chapters in a book. It just didn't really cross my mind. And scenes don't have to be these complicated 20, 30 shots, three minute long things. Even three shots back to back can be a scene. Lady hops in car. Lady walks in the grocery store and grabs something off the shelf. Lady drives home. That's a scene. The beauty of shooting scenes and thinking this way is that you give yourself more possibilities in the edit. If you shoot one shot, a single shot that's beautiful and, and it's your baby, you know, you just captured this one moment, say, I don't know, a beautiful sunset or something, and you have no context around it, it may not fit in your edit. There just might not be the perfect spot for a single shot, or it might not be a long enough shot for the quote that you wanna use under it. But if you think of scenes, and you think in this way, you give your shots context. You give your shots a higher possibility that they'll end up in the edit because they might fit better in your story. And you don't even necessarily know where that scene's gonna end up. You might have one idea for the quote from an interview that you wanna use under that footage. And when you hop into the edit, you realize that the emotional tone of that scene just works like way better over something someone else said. But because you have that story block that you can work with and move around in the edit, odds are you're gonna use that footage way more than if you just have a single clip. So if you ever capture a shot that you wanna use in your edit, you think it's beautiful, make sure to capture some context around it. Capture a scene and it will pay dividends in the editing room. Number eight, truth does not exist in documentaries. 
Seeking to tell the quote truth is a noble goal. And I think it's something that as filmmakers, we want to and should strive to achieve. The problem with objective truth is that when we're telling stories, it's ultimately going through a human brain, a brain that has experience, has bias, has opinions, has a view of the world. And so all of the facts get filtered through this experience. When you're making a documentary film, it's your opinion, it's your perspective on a situation or series of events that's unfolding. What's true to you and your view of the world might not be true to your audience. When you're interviewing characters, all of the stories and facts they're telling you are through their own filter, through their own bias. So the objective truth gets lost. We experience the world differently as unique individual human beings. In the book, The Science of Storytelling, author Will Storr says, human drama, fictional or otherwise, is caused by one person believing they understand what another person is thinking, but they are actually wrong. In other words, the collision between two people's versions of reality is central to conflict in any story, and it's what makes stories interesting. So while I think it's important to set a moral standard for yourself to try and tell stories as true to the events as possible, you got to cut yourself a little bit of slack because ultimately telling any story is a form of manipulation. You're manipulating the data, the information to structure it in a way that's emotionally compelling for your audience. I know the word manipulation sounds a little icky, but this is just how stories work and how stories have always worked. And if it makes you feel any better, here is a quote from the documentary master Werner Herzog. I change facts to such a degree they resemble the truth more than reality. I mean, Werner said it best. Number nine, make great quotes happen. I'm generally a fairly shy person, at least in new environments. And when I was first making films, I felt nervous about being there. I felt like I was super noticeable as the guy with the big camera on his shoulder. And I felt like I just needed to tuck myself into the back corner of the room, stick on a zoom lens and just try and get things as they're unfolding. And I convinced myself that this is how documentaries were made. I realized that what makes a good director is that they're not afraid to inject themselves into the situation. They're not worried about walking up to someone and asking their opinion about something or getting someone to repeat an interesting thing they've said. Because the difference is a good documentary director knows when they've gotten great quotes or when they're missing pieces of information and how that will affect their story. When I say make great quotes happen, I don't mean write out a perfect line that would be the little bow tie at the end of your story. I just mean you need to actively set up situations where interesting lines of dialogue will be said. Think of it as creating scenes or situations where your character will naturally want to talk about the thing that you need them to talk about. For example, if you're making a film about someone's past and they have an interesting story about their mom, get them to sit down on a couch and film them flipping through their photos. Not only will this give you great visuals, but when you set up this scene, it feels natural to then ask them questions about specific photos and get them to talk and open up more about their mom or their interesting childhood stories. And that's how you cultivate an environment where your character is willing to open up and give you good lines. Number 10, pitching is easier with proof. Getting funding for your project is a bit of a chicken and egg situation. Investors want to see some proof of what you can do in order to give you money. But as a filmmaker, you need some money in order to provide any proof of what your film 
could be. Now, I think it's a great idea to make a pitch deck to outline your story, what it's gonna be about, have some images in there to set the tone and style of your film. However, as filmmakers, writing isn't really what we do. We make films. If we want to display our skills, we're far better off showing investors a snippet of what we can do in the form of a video. Even if you don't have much money, there's ways you can scrounge together enough material to make something that you can put in front of an investor. You can make a one minute sizzle reel of clips you've already shot, maybe for other projects that are relevant. You can put footage under it and maybe you do a Zoom call with your main character and get them to say a couple quotes that you could use that help tell the general story. Or you could even go out and shoot a small version of a scene that might end up in the film. If you put yourself in the shoes of the investors, if you think about you giving money, your money to a filmmaker to make a film, it's much easier to put your money behind something or someone when you have proof that they can do it. Think of your sizzle reel of your teaser as proof so they can trust your vision, so that they can understand that you have not only the passion and the desire to do it, but also the understanding of how to tell a story and how to set a style and have a unique voice for your film. These are things that just can't really be communicated that strongly through your usual pitch deck PDF. All right, we made it to the end of the list. If you're still watching, I hope that means you've found some of the tips in here useful or applicable to wherever you're at in uh, the craft of making a film. If you enjoy this kind of stuff, if you enjoy learning about the ins and outs of how to make documentary films, I'd love for you to stick around, hit that subscribe. I plan on releasing these videos every week. If you have any other questions, leave them in the comment section below. If it's simple enough, I'll try and answer it there. And if not, maybe I'll make a video about it in the future. Other than that, good luck with whatever project you're currently working on. Wish you luck and I'll see you guys in the next one. Later. <laughs>